few readings for us this morning as um, Kevin prepares to come and share with us today. The first one's in Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 4 through to 9, and then we'll be jumping over to Ephesians, chapter 6. Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9. It's part of a long discourse. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your, of your houses and on your gates. Ephesians chapter 6. I'll just double check this, Kevin. You want just through to 19 rather than 20? Or? It seems to move into the next part. No, no, it should be right. My mistake. <laughs> we'll get it right. Right out. Ephesians chapter 6, 10 to 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore put on the full armour of God so that when the day of evil comes you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with a readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, Words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. May God give us understanding. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you, Lord, for this time that we can have to uh, sort, of, sort of look at your word and see what you're teaching us. Lord, I pray that you'll open our hearts, that you'll, 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 you'll teach us from your word this morning. I pray that you'll open my mouth, that your words will be spoken. In Jesus' name, amen. Just as a pre, uh, precursor, um, there are a lot of Bible passages in the, re in the message this morning, so if you can't keep up, at least make note of the, um, of the passages, but don't try and chase them with me. Uh, we're doing a Bible marathon in essence. So um, um, at least write down the references and that'll, that'll help you keep up with us. Did you know there's been five months since we started Ephesians? We've covered a lot of ground in that time. Ephesians has shown us the gospel. It has shown us the way to God. We've been taught how to live, how to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. I don't know about you, but five months ago, I've forgotten a lot of the stuff that we learned. But because it has been such a long time since we started Ephesians, I thought a very quick overview would be in order. So let's get into that overview. Ephesians 1 to 3 tells the gospel, and this is a summary in a nutshell. We were chosen 
before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before God. We were adopted as sons and daughters through Jesus. We've, re, we've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. That's how our sins are forgiven. Our salvation, our inheritance is secure, sealed by the Holy Spirit. God showed us his immeasurable goodness by demonstrating his love toward us. And God showed us his great, the greatness of his power, which is evidenced by the resurrection of Jesus. This is the way we were. We were dead in our sins. But God has made us alive together in Christ. Why did he do this? God loved each one of us so much that he wanted to impart the riches of his grace. For by grace, we are saved through faith. It's a gift. We can't earn it. And it's given freely for us. That's the gospel. That is Paul showing us the way to God. That's the good news. Do you know the gospel? Has it changed your life? Have you accepted God's gift to you? Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4 through to, through to chapter 6 verse 9 is showing us how to walk the walk. Paul says, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Now, what does that mean? Let me put it like this. If we're not work, walking worthy of the calling to which we have been called, we're literally saying Christ has died on the cross. That's nice. We're slapping Jesus in the face and saying that his death means nothing to us. So Paul has given us a list of characteristics, if you like, of our lives in Christ. He brings out a lot of the fruits of the Spirit or personal character traits that reveal the Spirit working in our lives. Then he brings out the Ten Commandments. And finally, he brings out the greatest commandment that we just heard in, um, in Deuteronomy of love your neighbour, love your wife, love your children, love your workers as yourself. In other words, Luke 10, 27 says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. Okay, so Paul has pointed us to God and he has taught us how to live, how to walk the walk. Why would he have to do that? Should we not know how to live? Should we not know what the gospel is? Should we not know that God has changed our lives? Should we not know what the Christian life looks like? But then Paul says, finally, be strong in the Lord. Why? Look at verse 11. That you may, able to, you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So why would we be in a spiritual battle? Do you realize that as children of God, there are forces out there that are trying to make us stumble? The main force is the devil. What do we know about the devil? Well, in John 8, 44, it gives a pretty clear picture. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. Acts 10, 38 says that he was an oppressor where it says all, were, all who were oppressed by the devil. The devil hates God. The devil wants to destroy the church. The devil is a tempter. How does, he, how does he do all this stuff? By bringing disunity in the church. He undermines our confidence in Christ. He makes us doubt Jesus' finished work on the cross. He makes us doubt that God really loves us. 
He also makes us doubt, did God really say that? Same as what he said to Eve in Genesis 3, 1, when he said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? So we're in a full-on battle. If the battle and Satan are like this, how, does this, how might these translate into my Christian life? I'm sure we all struggle with different things in our lives that are like thorns in the flesh. They just niggle at us, making us doubt, making us lose our confidence in Christ. You know, when, um, when David was teaching us from Ephesians 5, one of the verses jumped out at me. And at verse 5 in chapter 5 says, For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, um, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. You know, the devil got into my head that day and he said that I was not really a Christian because I struggled with issues of immorality, that I was immoral. How can I be a follower of Christ when you're like that? You're not good enough, so there's no way that you can enter the kingdom of God. But then God spoke to my heart and he said in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if we confess our sins to God and there is true repentance and a willingness to turn your back on the sinful behavior, then God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God's working in my life and I'm sure that he's also working in yours. But it's not our strength that our lives changed. We can see in verse 10 of Ephesians 6, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Paul has written this letter and has explained the good news, the gospel. He has told us how to live. And then almost as if he's given us a three-point sermon, he says, finally, now I can tell you why I wrote this letter. I need to let you know something very important. Finally, put on the whole armour of God. Why? That you may, able, may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. What schemes? He wants to destroy the church. He tempts. He brings disunity in the church. He undermines our confidence in Christ. He makes us doubt Jesus' finished work on the cross. He makes us doubt that God really loves us. He makes us doubt, did God really say that? We are in a spiritual battle against ourselves. I was listening to a message from Pastor John Piper the other day, and he puts it this way. The battle for obedience is absolutely necessary for salvation because it is the fight of faith. The battle for obedience is absolutely necessary for getting, in, for getting to heaven because it is the battle against unbelief. It is the fight of faith. There is only one battle. It's the one that gets you started. It's the one that gets you there. And it's the fight of faith, not works. Jesus said to Peter in Luke 22, 31 to 32, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Let me read that again, but this time personalizing it. Kevin, David, Dorothy, Julie, Warren, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Did you hear that? Jesus has prayed for you personally that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers and sisters. 
you know, my mum and dad used to say to us when we were younger, actually they still do, that they pray for us each day. I thought they were just saying that. I didn't really believe them until one day I walked down the hall, one night I walked down the hallway toward their bedroom and I heard them praying for me. You can imagine how I felt. So now when I'm told that someone is praying for me, I don't doubt it. I'm humbled that the person cares enough for me to pray for me. Do we do the same for others? If we promise to pray for someone, do we? But think of how you feel when you know that Jesus is praying for you individually, personally. So this spiritual battle, what is it? You look at verse 12, it says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The NIV puts it, which I think was a version you read, was it, Warren? Um, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Verse 13, therefore, okay, so Paul says, I've told you why. Now listen carefully, because it is a spiritual battle. Take up the whole armor of God that you may, may be able to withstand or to endure or to persevere in the evil day when Satan is trying to sift you. And having done all to stand firm or to be immovable in Christ. Satan tries to sift us daily. He says, you're not good enough. You don't know your Bible, so how can you be a Christian? I know how to push your buttons to make you angry. And you know, I know a really good way to dishonor God. Look at this. Every day we're in a spiritual battle. So therefore, take up the whole armor of God. Did you hear what Paul said? The whole armor. Take it all. Don't be passive. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. So Paul is telling us, actually maybe um, telling is not the right word. He's ordering or commanding us to put on the whole armor of God. Why? That you may be, may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. As most of you know, I work in refrigeration and air conditioning. And what, when I was studying the refrigeration trades course, we were told that the most dangerous thing when dealing with refrigerant and oil mix is moisture. If there was a small amount of moisture in the system, it would, it would freeze up at a particular point in the system causing a blockage. Now, obviously the blockage would unblock as the ice melted, but would freeze and melt and freeze and melt. <laughs> you sort of get the picture, don't you? But if there was a huge amount of moisture in the system, it would freeze, but it, it would cause a reaction with the refrigerant and the oil to create hydrochloric acid and eat the system from the inside out. So we were told that there are safeguards or protection to make sure there was no possibility of moisture in the system. The first one was to make sure the joints are sealed properly. The second one was to make sure that there's no air or moisture in the system. So we, we had to evacuate the system to a low vacuum to get rid of any moisture. And this was our armor against breakdown or mechanical failure. And the same applies with our Christian life or our life in Christ. Paul says to put on the whole armour of God. In other words, God has provided us with safeguards or protection so that you, we, may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And those safeguards or protections form the armour of God. These are the armour of God. Now, that, that's not grammatically correct, but that's how it reads. 
And I've called this section seven things that Jesus has done for us. They'll become clear as we work through them, but they are Jesus has given, Jesus has declared, Jesus has taught, Jesus has provided, Jesus has paid, Jesus has spoken, and Jesus has opened. And they'll become clearer when we go through each one of those later. Verse 14 in Ephesians 6, Stand or be immovable in Christ, therefore having fastened on the belt of truth. What's a belt used for? To hold everything up and together. I've got a pair of shorts that um, are a little bit big for me. And if I don't have a belt on, I can take two steps and they're down around my ankles. I'm in trouble if I don't have a belt on. What is truth? Truth is a universal topic that we all seek to know and understand. Whether it's knowing the truth or speaking the truth, both are found in a growing relationship with God. When we spend time in God's word and in prayer, the truth is revealed to us. So the first thing that God, that Jesus has, has done for us, he's given us the truth. John 8, 32. Then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. First Kings 17, 24. Then the, then the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and the word of the Lord from your mouth is truth. And Psalm 25, 5. Guide me in your truth and teach me for you are God, my saviour, and my hope is in you all day long. The next part of the verse in Ephesians says, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. What does the breastplate, breastplate protect? It protects the heart. If you want to take someone down, you would aim for the heart. And guess what the devil targets? Our heart. Righteousness is the quality of being morally right or justifiable. But, you know, Jesus has declared us righteous. Genesis 15, 6. Abram believed the Lord and he credited to him as righteousness. Romans 3, 22. This righteous in, righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. Verse 15 in Ephesians 6. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. It's interesting to note that the Christian life is a journey. And Paul says that the gospel of peace is our footwear. Now, I know some cultures don't have footwear, but imagine what it'd be like for us if we didn't have footwear. We'd be burning our feet on the, on the roadside, on the footpaths. We'd be cutting our feet wherever we walked. But, but think about it like this. Would you be willing to share the gospel of peace at a moment's notice? Do we know Jesus that well that we want to speak his words to everyone we come in contact with? Because his gospel is our life, is our walk. So how can we tell others about Jesus if we do not walk with readiness, with the shoes of the gospel. So Jesus has taught us the gospel. We all know what the gospel is, don't we? It's good news. And wherever Jesus went, he proclaimed the gospel. Matthew 4, 23. And he went through all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. Matthew 9, 35. And Jesus went through all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and affliction. Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. 
And then in the final verses of Matthew, we are told to go into the world and preach the gospel, to preach the good news, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. How can we go into all the world if we don't know the gospel? How can we equip others to walk the walk if we don't know the gospel? Verse 16 in Ephesians 6. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. In all circumstances, in all situations, all day, every day, take up the shield of faith. Believe God. He will work it out. Trust him. Believe him. And Paul adds a side note there with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Look out. Here comes the flaming darts. Doubt. <laughs> Disunity. <laughs> Grieving the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Lies. <laughs> Deceit. <laughs> Temptation. <laughs> Anything that the devil throws us. <laughs> Jesus has provided us with faith. Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. There's a story in Mark 11, verse 20 to 24, where they pass by a, a, a fig tree. And it says, as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Romans 1, 1 to 5. I, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. By faith, we know that God has saved us. By faith, we believe God will provide our needs. By faith, we know that God answers prayer. By faith, we know that God still performs miracles. By faith, we know that Jesus is preparing a place for us. By faith, we know that God has given us eternal life. By faith, we know that God raised Jesus from the dead and he sits at God's right hand. By faith, we know that Jesus is coming again. By faith, we, will, we know that Jesus will collect the church together and we will rise to meet him in the air and join Jesus and the angels praising God for eternity. How's your faith? Are you lifting the shield? Verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation. Another area if we, we aim for if we wanted to destroy someone is the brain. Our brain is crucial for us to live. It's a control center for everything we do. It's our physical, emotional, our everything nerve center. If we allow things into our brain by what we read, listen to, or and hear, that all affects our brain. And because technology has come so far and is a big part of our lives, it also affects our brain. I was listening to a report on Vision Radio's program called 2020 One Day. And the person being interviewed was saying that depression and suicide have risen dramatically over the last 10 to 15 years because of technology. 
the person was saying that in the past, if a person was being bullied or harassed at school or at work, that person could go home and have a reprieve from the attacks and be ready to face them the next day. These days with social media, people get attacked 24 seven. They don't have that, that reprieve. So this brings about depression and anxiety that is unsurpassed. Damage a person's brain and they're just a vegetable. Kill the person's brain, they're dead. I remember not long after I came to Armidale, Eric Stannard, whom I was living with at the time, called me outside to witness how he downed a cow. Now, I grew up in the city, so this was a new experience for me. So I watched as he lined up this point in the middle of the cow's head and fired. The cow's legs just went and he's on the ground, dead. I just stood there with my mouth open in a state of unbelief. Blew me away. So where does the devil attack? Our brain, our salvation. You know, Jesus paid for our salvation. Acts 4, 11, 12, Peter says to the rulers and the people, this Jesus is a stone that was rejected by you and there is salvation in no one else for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. You are not your own you, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Your salvation is secure. Verse 17, the last part of verse 17 says, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Jesus has spoken the word of God. The sword, the name of God, the only true word, the only weapon that we can use against the devil. James 4, 7 says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Hebrews 4.12 For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and the spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. It tells the truth. We need to be reading and understanding God's word. We need to be hiding God's word in our heart. Psalm 119 verse 9. How can a man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalm 119 verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And in verse 18, Paul says, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. You know, Jesus has opened the way to God. We can call on God all the time, anytime. Do you remember the song, The Royal Telephone? Theologically, it's totally off theme, but it sort of gives us a clear picture when, when the lyrics say, Central's never busy, always on the line. You can hear from heaven almost any time. There'll be no charges. The telephone is free. It is built for service just for you and me. There will be no waiting on this royal line. Telephone to glory always answers just in time. So that's not theologically correct, but it gives us a good picture. Romans 12, 12, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Then 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In Philippians 4, 6, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. We need to get on our knees and pray all the time. 
We need to be talking to God about everything in our lives. We need to be praying for the people we come in contact with each day. What are our worries, our concerns? How can I talk to, to someone about Jesus? I don't know what to say. And how can I show, show others that God is the centre of my life and he has changed me? So put on the armour of God. Keep alert. Be diligent. Pray for the saints. Let God fight the battle for you. Paul says, therefore, take up the whole armour of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Did you hear that? To stand firm. May we all be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. May we be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. May we keep alert with all perseverance. Let's put on the whole armour of God and stand firm. Can I ask you, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus? If you don't, now is the time to accept God's free gift of grace. But because we don't know what the next minute holds, let alone the next hour, the next month, the next year, if you wait, it could be too late. I talk to myself or David or Sam or someone you feel comfortable with and find out how you can have a personal relationship with Jesus and how he can change your life. Jesus died for each one of us because he loved, because of his love for us. He longs to have a relationship with all of us. For those who have wandered away from God, I urge you to come back now. Confess you have wandered away and get right again with God. For those who already have this relationship, I urge you to put on the whole armour of God so that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. I urge you to take up the armour of God, the whole armour of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. We all need protection from the evil one. Only God provides this protection. So put on the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness and the shoes of the gospel of peace and the helmet of salvation. Lift high the shield of faith and carry the sword of the spirit. Pray without ceasing. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you, Lord, for your word this morning and the way you have taught us to teach us how to put on the whole armour of God. Strengthen us in your might that our lives may show the glory of Jesus to others and that they can come to know you as well. I pray that we can, we can take this message to heart and, and, and learn how to, to be closer to you, to be protected by you. In Jesus' name. Amen.